your digital agenda is your business agenda. You got to be very deliberate and intentional about your transformation journey. You got to be very clear about what objective that you want to achieve and what are the measure of success for you. You don't do it because other people are doing it. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And you got to figure out what is the right thing for your organizations. Hey everyone, my name is Henry Surya Wirawan. And you're listening to the Tech Lead Journal, the show where I'll be bringing you the greatest technical leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders in the industry to discuss about their journey, ideas, and practices that we all can learn and apply to build a highly performing technical team and to make an impact in your personal work. So let's dive into our journal. Hey everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tech Lead Journal podcast. Very happy to be back here again to share with all of you my conversation with another great technical leader in the industry. Thanks for tuning in and spending your time with me today, listening to this episode. If you're new to the podcast, know that Tech Lead Journal is available for you to subscribe on major podcast apps such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and many more. Also, do check out and follow Tech Lead Journal social media channels on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Every day, I post nuggets of wisdom from the latest podcast episode, and I share them on those channels to give us some inspiration and motivation for us to get better each day. And if you'd like to make some contribution to the show and support the creation of this podcast, please consider joining as a patron by visiting techleadjournal.dev/patron. I highly appreciate any kind of support, and your contribution would help me towards sustainably producing this show every week. For today's episode, I am happy to share my conversation with Johnny Wijaya. Johnny is the head of Bank of New York Mellon Asia Pacific Innovation Center, and he has over 18 years of experience in business and digital transformation throughout his career. In this episode, we learn from Johnny the sustainable innovation story at BNY Mellon an internationally renowned financial institution that has been around for over 237 years. A company that has been around for that long and is still thriving certainly has a lot of things to admire from, especially in terms of resilience, innovation, and reinvention. Being at the forefront of innovation within the bank, Johnny shared the latest BNY Mellon digital innovation journey and the challenges that the bank had to overcome in order to rewire the legacy mindset and the culture within. Johnny also explained further the concept of what it means to be digital at BNY Mellon, its innovation playbook, and his advice on successful digital transformation. He also shared his personal transformation journey that he had to go through in order to put the innovation mindset at his core, which plays a critical part in his successful innovation leadership. I hope you will enjoy this episode, and if you like it, consider helping the show by leaving a rating, review, or comment on your podcast app or social media channel. Those reviews and comments are one of the best ways to get this podcast to reach more listeners, and hopefully they can also benefit from the contents in this podcast. So let's get this episode started right after our sponsor message. Are you looking for a new cool swag? Techly Journal now offers you some swags that you can purchase online. These swags are printed on demand based on your preference and will be delivered safely to you all over the world where shipping is available. Check out all the cool swags available by visiting techleadjournal.dev slash shop. And don't forget to brag yourself once you receive any of those swags. Hey everyone, welcome back to another new episode of the Tech Lead Journal. Today I have with me a friend, long time back. I met him in one of my previous company. His name is Johnny Wijaya. Johnny currently is the head of APEC Innovation Center at Bank of New York Mellon. So we'll be talking a lot about innovation today, especially in the context of financial services industry. So welcome to the show, Johnny. Good to have you here. Good morning, Henry. It's been a while. Great to see you. So Johnny, for people who don't know yet about you, maybe can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Maybe you can mention about your career journey, what are the highlights and major turning points so far? Sure. So 
Yeah, I've been, been in industry for over 18 years. I grew up in Indonesia and I finished my degree in computer science. That's where I started my career 18 years ago. Well, it has been 18 years of interesting journey, at least for me, where I have opportunities to learn from the leaders and colleagues from diverse background, working on interesting and purposeful missions. My work has also brought me to travel across the globe. So I've been working around the region, ASEAN, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and also broader Asia Pac in Japan, China, South Korea, Taiwan, EMEA, and the US. I've been going through ups and downs, but then all of these have been a valuable experience and it's, it's really enriching in shaping my perspective, thinking, way of working, and my leadership. So if I may summarize, basically, I'll say the three chapters of my career. So I spent about seven, eight years of the first part of my career in technology consulting. I started as a software engineer or software analyst later on, leading an engineering team. And then my last role before I moved on to banking was a technology architect. I would say there's a couple of really good key lessons during that first chapter. Obviously, being a consultant, you've got to be very versatile. You've got to learn how to deal with unknowns and ambiguities. Every engagement is unique. It comes with its own nuances. You also learn how to be client-centric. How do you put your client needs and challenges at the center of everything you do? Again, you are hired because the client needs your help. And again, with all these sort of interesting projects, it certainly hone your problem-solving skills. Teamwork as well, very important. So I had been in the project team of as small as five people to a program that have 100 people coming together, working together to deliver that big piece of program. Last but not least, it's also about the discipline around execution. You finish what you start and finish it well and follow it through. So when I look back in this first chapter, this has been really a great valuable foundational skills that actually gain in value as I progress with my career. So this is the first chapter of my career. But even before I switch to the second chapter, I mean, I definitely enjoy a lot of the adrenaline rush with solving difficult problems, chasing deadlines. But early in my career, I was quite lucky as well because I also experienced a very important lesson from this one particular project. We were working hard for it for six, seven months, six days a week, and in some Sundays that actually we come in as well. I still remember, despite working so hard and trying to deliver your best, the first day of the testing, we couldn't even pass beyond the second test scenario. But again, if I look back, it was a classic waterfall problem where you spend two months gathering requirements and you move on and then happily do your bill in vacuum and then you return to show the clients afterwards. I mean, as you could imagine, within that four months, there's just so many things have changed. The requirements, the assumption, and all those kind of stuff. So again, expensive, but it's valuable lesson. It's painful, but it's good to kind of learn it early, right? And then towards the end of the chapter, basically, where I figure that I have this strong call that whatever I do, I just want to make sure that I truly make an impact. And I feel like as a consultant, I learn a lot. But to truly understand the client needs, you sort of need to empathize deeply or at least to some extent. And that is what I feel like I need to pick a particular vertical where I can actually build that deep empathy. So that is where I start to look into financial services. And that's going to jumpstart my career into banking. So that's going to lead to chapter two of my career. When I moved to this global private bank that was just embarking on a massive three years transformation program, setting up their next generation banking system from ground up. This is where I met you, Henry. You were working on different work stream. I was hired as an engineering lead for a work stream that was looking into integrating behavioral finance into investment. How do you bring behavioral finance into a risk tolerance assessment, to portfolio construction and rebalancing? And so once you build that portfolio, how you push it then to the order management system. So it was a great experience. I was working with product owner, program manager, business analysts who are based in UK. We're building the system from ground up and get to work also with a lot of very smart PhD in behavioral finance. And eventually the system went live to all the key markets in the UK, US, Singapore, Hong Kong, Geneva, Monaco, and so on. It was good fun. And I learned a couple of more skills there. That was the first time that I actually learned Agile delivery. I was really fortunate back then that we have an Agile coach who is very experienced that actually worked from us in the beginning. I guess I've seen many failed attempts in Agile adoptions where teams are sent for training and expected to be expert the next day. Quite frankly, that's given the bad price for Agile. I was pretty proud to be part of that team because we were able to deliver what could have been a three years book of work in two and a half years. The second thing is also, it's really honing my engineering skills back in that bank. 
because I was very fortunate to be surrounded by great engineers, or maybe today people call it what, 10x developers, including yourself, Hendrik, right? <laughs> Who are not just good at writing code, but also care about architecture design, developer productivity, understand the importance of good engineering practice and hygiene. And these are all the stuff that's really important if you really want to do an agile delivery or continuous delivery. This is talking about separation of concern, test-driven development, how do you build a pipeline from unit tests to coverage testing, regression tests. Back then, we built all this pipeline on cruise control, and then we published the artifact to Nexus. And again, it's also talking about how do we manage dependency and auto-deployment. These are all the good stuff that years before people talk about DevOps and microservice architecture. So it was good fun. I learned a lot. And then the third thing is, it's also important that I learned a lot as well in terms of how do you build a reliable, scalable, and maintainable applications. So when I used to work as a consultant, it's just the nature of the job. You finish your project and another project waits for you, and you just keep moving on from one project to another project. Just like anything in life, your design is going to get tested over time. So this is where, because you work in the bank and use the environment, you build a system and support it. And this is where you start to learn about the impact of some certain design decision that you make. So I learned a lot in terms of the best practices, the consideration for building a truly reliable, scalable, and maintainable applications. All together, more importantly, how to be a good engineer. So that is really a valuable lesson. People call you at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Now you start understanding why and all those good stuff. So that's kind of like the second chapter of my career. If I may sum it up, it's really about picking up agile delivery, good hygiene, good engineering practice. And again, I learned a lot from engineering perspective, but it doesn't really satisfy my craving for wanting to learn more about the business or getting closer to the business side and really to become the bridge between the business and technologies. So that is where I got a call from a headhunter and lend me a job into Bank of New York Mellon where I am. It has been good fun, seven years of journey, I'm still here now. And basically, I started my career there with the missions back then. The team is looking to strengthen our international technology team based out of Asia, really focusing about how we better serve our growth and the region as well as the client. So we have done many things from setting up a new lean team to delivering greenfield projects, such as setting up our FX trading hub for Asia G10 currency based out of Singapore. For example, implementing multiple solutions and systems that allow our business growth, including four years ago, very deeply involved in setting up our innovation lab in Asia based out of Singapore. So I would say it has been a journey of entrepreneurship and innovation so far at Birma Mellon's. Very empowered to really be able to translate, take ownership of some of our key priorities, launch it, execute it. It's good fun. And I know we're going to talk a lot, but I guess the last bit I would say is that the last four years doing all this innovation thing has truly rewired my whole brain. And I'm happy to share more. What does that mean? Thanks for sharing your story, Johnny. I think it's been a while since we met back then. Time flies, really. So maybe you tell us a little bit more. I'm very interested when you say you have to rewire your brain. I'll let you give a little bit of context to our audience here. So what kind of challenge are you seeing and facing in BNY Mellon that will lead you to a lot of innovations within this APEC center, I would say? So what kind of things that BNY was traditionally known for and what do you need to do in order to innovate within the bank? Sure. So Bank of New York Mellon is actually one of the oldest financial institutions in the world. We are 237 years young financial institutions that has been around. Today, we continue to play a critical role providing the market infrastructure for financial services. So what does that mean? We are trusted by clients to custodize and administer 41 trillion of assets. That's a huge amount, right? It's about 20% of the world asset, probably if not 30%. We are the top seven largest asset manager globally with more than over 2 trillion asset under management. On a daily basis, we process 9 trillion of government securities and clearing transactions. So all this kind of come together has positioned us to be a global systematically important financial institution that's playing that critical role in the financial services. As you could imagine, 238, that's a long time. So how does the bank last for that long? I think that is also what attracted me and I'm very proud to be part of that story now. So really it's a story of resilience, reinventions and innovations. You don't last that long if you don't know how to reinvent yourself. So I think we actually started with a very good start because innovation is already a part of our DNA. 
The question really is about how do we evolve this innovation DNA and operating system along with time, right? So that then we can stay relevant and be around for another 200 years. So that is really the focus of what my group is doing, which is again, is actually an integral part of our digital transformation strategy. Like I mentioned, it's already part of our DNA, but the question is that how do we accelerate it? How do we upgrade it? Just to be clear as well, I think innovation should be the job of everybody in the company. It's not job of a central function. So really three things that we spend a lot of effort on this in terms of building that hopefully new muscle memory for everybody in the firm. So first is really about how do we cultivate the culture of experimentations, which really means about how do you be really good at trying things? Because again, innovation doesn't happen overnight. You got to try, how do you cycle through idea and hypothesis really fast in a way that you can then generate a breakthrough or innovation and all this kind of stuff. The second thing is really about how we better embrace the world. There's so much innovation that's going on across the world. How do we be really good at collaborating with the rest of the ecosystem? And the third thing is really about how do we make sure that we bring all these hypotheses that we have tested along with the best of the world and put it to production or roadmap. And while at the same time as well, in some cases, maybe we can launch a new business model. So these are the three things that kind of like our focus. We created a lot of different programs or enablers, if you may, that allow the bank to experience this new way of working. Again, a lot of focus of changing the way we work as part of the upgrade. And then the byproduct of this is basically you're going to see more and more innovations. So I'm very intrigued when you say the bank has been around for like 237 years. That's pretty long time. Then it's quite amazing. So being introduced in this position in the innovation lab to innovate, I'm sure there are a lot of challenges. So from your personal experience, what were some of the toughest challenges that you have to overcome during these last seven years in the bank? Sure. So this is why I kind of touched on earlier that I myself go through a lot of rewiring. I think first, let's start with myself first, because again, I think the key thing is when you talk about innovation, it's really it's about the art of the possible and really about how do you shift that thinking from the how to the what and the why. That is not easy because human like to solve problems. People come to you, okay, let's figure out a solution for this. But again, a lot of time, you're not really solving the right problem or you might be just solving a symptom of the problem. So that's number one. So I myself have to hold myself, no matter how passionate I am or how eager I am to solve the problem. But you know what, Johnny, what is the what and the why? The how, it can come later. So that is one aspect. The second thing is that we all experience people. We come with our own prior experience and also way of working. The muscle memory is there. So when you talk about innovation, you really need to really come with that artist or dreamer mindset in the beginning, how to switch off your prior experience. Not saying that that's not important, but when you explore the possibilities, you really need to come in as that beginner mindset. You ask a lot of open questions, you don't have a judgment, you're not skeptics about stuff. And then when you get to execution, that's normally your past experience will become very helpful. So that is really the second thing. Again, how do you hold that the two keys to the two doors and know when to switch it on and off? That is hard, right? The third thing is really about people talk about all these different ways of working. People talk about design thinking, experience design, strategic design. Then you've got agile, you've got data science. How do you make sense of all these things? And again, this thing cannot happen in vacuum. Great things happen when actually all these things come together. So that is the kind of stuff that I also spend a lot of time like trying to understand, ah, okay, you know what? This is why people talk about CX, for example, strategic design, right? It's really about building that true empathy. What is the problem we are trying to solve? Who are we solving for? Which persona? What is the aspiration for the personas? What are the values that is most important to the personas? What are the user journey of the persona that the person is having an issue? Those are strategic design stuff. And then it doesn't stop there. But you start understanding that, then you're going to start to bring it into some level of visuals where people can actually appreciate what you're talking about. And that get translated into a UX, UI kind of mockups. And then how do you bring it forward? You go through your usability testing and all the stuff. Then how do you pass it on next to prototyping? How do you translate it to epic user stories? And then as usual, engineering will pick it up, whether it's data scientists and so on and so forth. So all these things, it cannot happen in vacuum. And you're going to be able to string it all together and then you become, 
ah, okay, now I see. I see what do you mean by this new way of working. It just feels so good that I don't want to go back to the past. So that is a lot of internalizations and learning. So the last bit that I just want to also add as well is that how do you then explain also all these different concepts in a way that's easy for the business, for the rest of the firm to understand. So kind of like this day, I try to explain to people what we do is that we help you to get from zero to one, one to five, and five to ten. So what does that mean? As with any great things in life, it started with this zero amazing ideas. It can happen anywhere as you're walking on the road or you're eating and you're seeing something. But then you tell your friends or you tell your colleagues, people get excited, but so what? Yes, we are excited, but again, it's so abstract, it's so high level. This is what I call Jiro. So then we have a program for people like that who come up with this great idea, so excited. You talk to a lot of people, a lot of people say, do it, it's the right thing to do. But then, so what? So we have a program that can help to get that Jiro to one. Essentially, how do you bring more clarity to that vision? How do you sharpen it? And then you can get a lot more buy-ins from people. And then once you get that, so what? Again, next. That is where I talk about one to five, where you start to pick a couple of thin slices of that vision and start to build something more tangible for people to poke a hole on it and to opine on it, to give feedback. And then five to 10 is really is about when you sort of like, oh, I have something and I got a feedback. More people seeing it, more people get excited over it. Now, how do we start building this properly? And obviously 10 to 100 is not what we do within the center because otherwise we all become production support and <laughs> no longer able to innovate. Yeah. I like the way that you so-called framework it like zero to five, one to five, five to 10, 10 to 100. So it's really a good analogy, I would say, in terms of building from ideation up to the real product that many people are using. So I'm sure in the innovation world, one of the key challenges is actually working with the existing culture and people whereby people might be comfortable in what they were doing, not necessarily wants to change and taking risks and innovate, so to speak. What are some of the memorable challenges, in your opinion, in your experience, on dealing with the legacy mindset and the culture that are existing? Well, I think the reality is that change is hard. And especially if you have built that muscle memory for a long time, it's just applied to everybody. I would say... I think that the fact is that we have been in this business for four years and we continue to double down on this is obviously memorable for me because you started with this shiny place where I'm sitting now, then what? Is it just a furniture or it's just a space? So the space create the environment where you can foster creativity and collaborations. So I would say that obviously you need to start inspiring people. That's the most important thing. And you need to take some level of risk. You need to be able to pick what are some of your low-hanging fruits. Obviously, with anything new, people have to go through what exactly these people are doing. Does it make sense? This is where you got to pick the light, low-hanging fruit. you got to pick the right risk and just keep iterating through that. And then people start to seeing it over time. People start to, wow, why can't I do this? In fact, to us, I think is that if everybody see what we do and feel inspired by that and want to copy the playbook, that is exactly what we want to do. Then we can go and start thinking about what is that next level of upgrade. I know it sounds cliche, but this is the thing with change. And I think more importantly is that you must have that support from the top of the house, that level of commitment. You got to have a discipline in execution as well. Meaning to say that you got to follow it through. We've seen too many people just starting stuff and they never finish. And that is bad for something like this because you kind of like show me something shiny and then you give me a promise of a better way of working. You then bring me into some sort of experimentation. And halfway through, you give up yourself. So that is bad, right? So you got to follow through. Along that journey, people will learn, people will get inspired, and then the chain reaction will happen. This is also what I see in my personal view. So there are many, many digital transformation journey this day. Almost every company would like to embark or if not already embarking on that. And a lot of such innovation centers are created as well because of this moment to transform the whole company. What I see as a challenge, right? So when you embark on this digital transformation is the patience. So how would a company, especially coming from the traditional legacy mindset, being able to transform and the expectation normally I would see is that they wanted to do it fast, which sometimes is a little bit challenging because like what you mentioned, innovation doesn't come in vacuum. There are so many disciplines come together. So many people and culture that you need to change. So maybe as someone who have done it, what would be your advice to people who are also embarking on this journey about how to execute well 
And what kind of reasonable expectation coming out of this transformation journey? Sure. So my advice is a couple of things. First, definitely, this needs to come from the top of the house. You need the buy-in. And we are very fortunate because our top of the house, from the board of director to the CEO and the whole leadership team, really understand the importance of us getting on this digital transformation journey, which, by the way, is an ongoing journey and it will never end. The second thing is that you don't separate your digital agenda from your business agenda. For us, it's the same. That is why our head of digital is also our CEO for our largest business line, asset servicing. Your digital agenda is your business agenda. The third thing is that you got to be very deliberate and intentional about your transformation journey. You got to be very clear about what objective that you want to achieve and what are the measure of success for you. And for us, we are very clear on that. So what I mean by that is that we are very clear what does it mean to be digital for us. We are very clear in terms of how do we want to transform this bank. We call it digitizing this very bank. I can explain that later if you're interested. We have formed a cross-functional team even at the leadership level that constantly making sure that, to your point, we continue to discuss progress, we collaborate, we define our priorities, and, and then more importantly, we don't end up in a parallel track, end up building technologies that nobody wants to use. So all of these things coming together is really important. The last thing I would say that you don't do it because other people are doing it. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And you've got to figure out what is the right thing for your organizations. Wow, thanks for that. I think it's a very good reason to actually embark on digital transformation. So don't do it because other people are doing it. <laughs> and you're like missing the boat if you don't. Do it for the right thing. So the other thing that I see a lot of digital transformation is about putting technologies, jargons, the latest tech, the brightest tech, sprinkle all over the organization. So things like, for example, AI and ML, or do things like agile transformation, or blockchain chatbots. I don't know how to see this personally, because a lot of times, yes, you need to innovate and introduce new technologies. But when you said just now, what does it mean to be digital? Maybe you can share a little bit. What does it mean for you and the company about digital? What exactly are you transforming? Great question, Henry. So yeah, as I mentioned, we are very intentional and we do actually think hard about it. And we do actually have a clear definition of what does it mean to be digital at PNY Mellon. So absolutely, it's not just about technology. For us, it's really about four things. So number one is about how do we be truly client obsessed? How do we embed client at the center of everything we do? How do we involve client early in the process of our product roadmap, product iterations? And not only that, how do we put client at the center of our day-to-day -day when it comes to servicing the client? So number two is also about embracing the world, how to be open to the world. Innovation is not a monopoly of particular companies or particular locations. There's so many innovation around the world. So we are proud today that we partner with fintechs to the large tech, or in some cases also with our competitions and obviously with our clients. The third thing is also about, you mentioned about all these great technologies, blockchain, AI, ML, and all this stuff, but really about how do you embed these technologies in your day-to-day, -day, how you service your client. That's the most important thing. The last thing is that how do you unlock the value of the data? We are invested heavily in the foundational of our data capabilities. We see that that's becoming increasingly important when it comes to decision-making, operational efficiency, as well as deriving insights. So the last thing is that these four things that I mentioned is really is not a job of a particular function. Digital is a job for every employee in every location, in every office at BNY Mellon. So that's what it meant for us. So this is also coming back to what you said, right? innovation DNA, the playbook that you want everyone to be aware of. That's the first thing and wants to follow. Maybe if you can summarize, I know it might be tough. What is this playbook actually for the whole organization to adopt? How does it look like? So Henry, we see the three model in the industry and it's really important. We actually explain this to the whole organization. I think exactly to your point, you've got to explain it and you've got to keep repeating it. Then people will really start internalizing it and over time become a muscle memory. So we see the three types of uh, transformation and innovation in the industry. So the first one is, we call it as a Silicon Valley model, which is really about you create these sort of innovation labs or whatever you want to call it, garage or whatever, at all these fintech centers in all over the world. It could be in Singapore, it could be in London, or even Silicon Valley. It creates a lot of excitement. It sparks a different way of thinking, but it doesn't last. It doesn't change the core because it is an outpost. And the second thing is that basically we call this as a parallel bank. 
which is really about you create another version of your organization and you call it digital or whatever you want to call it, which is, again, doesn't have to deal with the legacy of people, process and tools. You can move very fast, but quite frankly, it's not sustainable as well because you then sort of like not able to harvest the collective intelligence, which is that 230 years of institutional knowledge. I do see that it creates a lot of friction as well. In the long run, then you end up with running two organizations. That's probably not the most efficient way of doing things. So for us, really, we call it digitizing this very bank, which is really about how do we transfer ourselves from the inside out, while at the same time not losing sight of what is going on across the world. That itself really is about how do we change the way we work. We have a very structured approach to this. The first one is we call it core digitization, really about we tell our employees is anything that's still physical and manual today, just to keep continue to digitize that. The second bit is really about we call it client reimagination. If you have opportunity to have a fresh look at your process, your tools, your business or your product, how do you reimagine this along with the clients? And the third thing is about how do you get into a new space, a new business model that doesn't exist in the past. And again, these three things is supported by digital capabilities that we have been investing over the years. I mentioned about client experience. How do you embed that human-centered approach in your day-to-day life? Human-centered approach is not about just building a software, right? It's a way of working. Then we talk about data. So you've got to invest in that foundational data capabilities from your data management to your data distribution to your data catalog to your data studio, all those kind of stuff. The third thing is, which is the innovation center where I spend a lot of my effort. How do you be really good at cycling through ideas? How do you be really good at experimenting? Digital partnership or collaboration is also an integral part of our strategy. How do you build connectivity? You say you want to embrace the world. How do you build connectivity with all the ecosystem around the world? How do you come up with the different programs that will make it easier for the startup to work with you? And then for those startups that's already working with you, how do you enhance the relationships? The next bit is when you start thinking about, you mentioned about AI. To us, when we think about AI, it's really first thing, it's not just about the technology. We have a hard look at this thing and say that, okay, well, it's actually not AI. It's actually human plus AI. How do you harvest the collective intelligence of human and machine? Because machine obviously do what machine does best and human does what human does best. So combining these together, you start thinking about how do you define that future operating model where you have human and AI work together. So this is where we start talking about how do you democratize technology. So these are stuff that I am trying my best to summarize it. It's a lot of things, yeah. Thanks for trying to explain that to us. Uh, The key thing, I mean, throughout this conversation, what I pick up as well, I like the way that you mentioned that it's all about the client reimagining what you do with your client, with your existing clients, and always trying to innovate how to serve them better through the human-centered approach. So I really like that. You also mentioned a couple of times now about playing a part in the ecosystem, partnering with the startups, small fintech, large fintech, and even competitors. Why do you think it's important to play a part in this ecosystem from the innovation point of view? Sure. Let me tie back a little bit to our business so that then it will bring a little bit of more context and relevance. So if you look at us as the world's largest global custodian, I'm talking about the 41 trillion asset under custody and administration. So we're not just focusing on being great at asset servicing, which is what the global custodian does, but also we are investing heavily on how to bring relevance directly to the front office. So front office are essentially, these are the people that's making investment decisions. So again, our clients is always looking for best of the bridge solutions that can differentiate themselves. And that's exactly why we launched Omni platform. Omni is our branding for our securities platform. It is an open and modular platform that is integrated with third-party capabilities so that then our clients can pick and choose what will work best for them. I'll give you an example. In the order management system, today we have partnerships with the market-leading OMS from BlackRock Aladdin to Bloomberg to Simcorp to Amundi Alto. So if our client is on that platform and they're using us as a custodian, we are there already and it's integrated. And it doesn't stop there. You talk about front office, you're going to talk about the risk manager as well. You've got to talk about the trader, you've got to talk about the sales, and then all the way down to middle and back office. So this kind of like gives you a sense. We are working with all the best providers out there and building that partnerships. Essentially, we are open to work with everyone. We share the same visions, ultimately about making a better client experience. If I were to summarize, so that's what I really translated into our platform, which we call it Omni, Open Modular Network Integrated. 
It's really is about how do we bring the best of BNY Mellon along with the best of the solution out there to give our client a choice, but at the same time, integrate it in a way that is hopefully frictionless. So, yeah, I mean, like working with the best of the breed definitely is something for me as a client, I would like to do so as well. A lot of these companies popping up, so-called the disruptors, I would love some of these capabilities to be integrated with the existing traditional companies like the banks and whatever the companies that have been around in the history of human life. So I think building these ecosystems certainly makes sense. But for people to actually be able to cooperate, like in business, it's like competition. People sometimes yeah. don't want to share what they have. What are some of the challenges for you to actually influence other people to be on board on this platform? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to the business, it's all about win-win, right? I think if you come in with that kind of attitude, it's about win-win. We want to partner with anyone who share our vision to make a better client experience. That's just a starting point. If you have a goal to improve the industry, if you have a goal to improve the industry, I guess we share the same visions. So again, it's a win-win proposition. I guess the key thing I would say that, I mean, people talk a lot about disruption. I would say that these days more about collaborations. I mean, if I look four years ago to today, I mean, I think the tone has changed a lot because obviously both whether the startup as well as the incumbent both have their own strengths and they both need each other actually. If I were to use Myanmar Mellon, again, we are very intentional, like I say, because we want to build an open modular network integrated platform. We really mastering the art of collaborations. This is where we have that capability as part of our strategy. As I mentioned to you earlier, how do we make it easier for startup to work with us? I just give you a bit of example. We have a program that accelerate the third party governance. Again, we are a regulated environment, but again, how do we help it to make sure that some of these startups who is not exposed to the type of regulations that we are subject to will understand by the same time as well, they're able to accelerate. We are building a sandbox that allow us to quickly proficient environment to work with the startup and so on and so forth. These are just some of the example, Henry. So in the beginning, when you share about this story, Obviously, one of the first challenges is to transform yourself. So I would like for you to share your key learnings and how you learn, especially for those people who are also heading this kind of digital transformation. How do you actually transform yourself in order to be able to lead this effectively? Well, I think it has gone to the next level in the sense that it's not like the kind of learning that you have when you're in your early 20s or maybe 30s. I think what is really important is how do you unlearn and relearn? That's important. Second thing, as I mentioned earlier, your past experience is so valuable. But when you want to embrace innovations, you got to know when to switch it off. And then you switch it on again when it comes to execution, as I mentioned earlier. This is really important. And the last thing is having intellectual humility. You may have all this experience, but you might be wrong. So having intellectual humility absolutely helps. And the last thing is that you can read as many books as you like, or you can talk to as many people, but the reality is that there's no one size fits all formula that will work broadly. So you got to figure out what is the model that will work for your organization. And that means that you got to try instrument, pivot, and try again and repeat. So in the last one year or so, right, I think we are all having great difficulty responding to COVID. And COVID is something that I think sparks a lot of innovation and digital transformation journey because people now have to work from home and you have to work over like video calls, something like this. So COVID is definitely one of the accelerator in terms of innovation. So in your view, what would COVID bring in terms of innovation? Like apart from these new technologies working from home that we have to do, what do you think are the accelerator that actually COVID brings to innovation? Yeah, so as you rightly pointed out, obviously it's an unprecedented event that nobody expects is, is painful. But I think the biggest takeaway is, is actually showing that human is actually adaptable. I think that's the most fundamental thing. We are all adaptable. So just to give you a sense, for us, we are able to shift to, you know, more than 90% people work from home within the first couple of weeks of this pandemic. So if you think about it, I mean, whether it's a global financial crisis or the World Trade Center event, nobody designed BCP site with 95% people work from BCP site. And I think all the past crisis doesn't have data around how do we deal with this pandemic that actually lasts that long. So I think for us, a couple of things. Number one, it certainly is a good stress test and validation to our digital transformation strategy. 
We are very happy for that in a way that we are proud that we are showing that nimbleness. We are able to move more than 90% of our workforce to work from home within a couple of weeks. And not only that, in the first month of February, March, the early part of the COVID, obviously you see a lot of market volatility. They obviously translated in higher volume of transactions. And yet, we are able to make sure that we execute on behalf of our clients. That's really important. We have also seen accelerated adoption of our digital tools, whether through our portals or APIs. And yeah, it's proven to be relevant. In fact, to your point, I think broadly across the industry, we all would agree that COVID does have accelerated digitizations. So Johnny, we talk a lot about innovations, the things that you try to change internally. Maybe you can share some of the biggest examples, publicly shareable stories of what are the innovations that BNY Mellon has successfully introduced and you are really proud of those. Sure, it's a lot actually. So first I mentioned about our Omni platform. It is open modular network integrated platform. I think we are the first one that come up with such a holistic and also not just talk about the concept, but actually bring together the integration into the platform that truly give our client choice. We are there when our client making that choice because we are integrated to the third party. The second thing is we launched our data analytics business. We now have cloud native data management capabilities, leveraging our 30 years of experience in data management. We own this fintech company called Eagle Investment. So now we are putting it on the cloud and further invest it in partnership with Microsoft, which we call it as a data fault. So there's this data management capability, multi-tenant, come with the taxonomy and all the good stuff that you need for data management is now available through data fault. And not only that, on top of that, we actually launched a suite of data analytics toolkit that will help data scientists as well as investment professionals to derive insights. So last year, we launched two applications called ESG app and distribution analytics applications. Both are award-winning applications that win recognitions from the industry. The ESG app uses AI machine learning data analytics techniques to crowdsource ESG factors to help the investment managers to make investment decisions. Distribution analytics is leveraging the power of our data management. We are able to predict, forecast the buying patterns that help the asset managers, product team to design and launch the products as well as their marketing team in terms of planning for the distribution of the products. This is just to name a few. And then we talk about AI and machine learning. As I mentioned, we started with this thinking, not just about just applying the AI. What's that really mean for us? When I say about AI working along with the human, right? So today our operation staff, in some cases, they do have augmentations that help them from AI such as document extraction, automated processing of the documents, reconciliations and stuff like that or even to getting more insight-driven kind of generations. This is where we talk about, for example, forecasting the liquidity, end-of-day liquidity, liquidity balances, to even predicting the movement in the securities lending fee. So this is just some of the few, and I can go on and on. Thanks for sharing the great success stories from your innovation center. So Johnny, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for introducing a lot of way of thinking from the innovation point of view, especially in terms of financial services and how you do it from traditional companies who have been around for hundreds of years. So I have just one last question, which I would normally ask for all my guests, which is for you to share your three technical leadership wisdom that you want to share with people. Sure, sure. So I think the first one is, I think a good leader is focused on bringing out the best in the team. And I think more importantly, is also about how do you help the team to see beyond what is obvious to their eyes? How do you help the team to break the artificial ceiling or sometimes a constraints or some sort of a mindset that often we just put it on ourselves? I think that is important. And I believe in that because I benefited so much from all the great leaders I've ever worked with before. The second thing is that I think a good leader brings clarity. The world is changing. There's so many changing going on now. Beginning of the year, you can try to plan as much as you wish, but the reality is that the world is changing. So how do you deal with the ambiguity? I think leadership play an important role in bringing that clarity. I think the good leader make choices, make decisions, because again, you can empower the team to make decisions, but there will be a situation whereby you need to have some level of convictions to say that, guys, this is the best decision that we have to take in this kind of situations, and you explain it. Last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, I think you got to have that intellectual humility because you may not be always right. There's so many smart people around you and you've got to respect that. If I may add on to that, which is kind of like what I keep telling my team as well. Well, continuous learning is part of your life. The world is changing. Best if you can figure out how to master that. 
And I think you can continue to stay relevant. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. So Johnny, for people who would like to connect with you, know more about your journey, where can they find you? You can hit me on LinkedIn. Just search Johnny Wijaya, Biron Mellon. I'm sure it's there. So yeah, happy to connect. So thanks so much, Johnny, for sharing your story. It's been a pleasure. So I wish you good luck for more innovations in the future. Thank you, Henry. It's been a while. It's great to connect again. Yeah, catch up soon. Thank you for listening to this episode and for staying right till the end. If you highly enjoyed, please share it with your friends and colleagues who you think would also benefit from listening to this episode. And if you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe and leave me your valuable review and feedback. It really, really helps me a lot in order to grow this podcast better. You can also find the full show notes of this conversation on the episode page at techlyjournal.dev website including the full transcript, interesting quotes and links to the resources and mentions from the conversation. And lastly, make sure to subscribe to the show's mailing list on techlyjournal.dev to get notified for any future episodes. Stay tuned for the next Techly Journal episode and until then, goodbye.